We're Zach and Jason, and we found peace. Good morning, Peace Church. If you don't mind standing up and helping us sing to the song. It's great to be here this morning with you. Praise the Lord. Amen. We step with saying, He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Whether it be praised. I've tried so hard to see it. Took me so long to believe it. That you drew someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection can Who you say? 
Let's take, uh, let's take a little bit of time and just say hi to each other. If you see someone new, please welcome them in, okay? Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here on this Sunday morning. Uh, we have a lot to do today, um, but I have a few announcements before we get started. The first one is I wanted to highlight the fact that we do have classes that are happening at the 930 service, not only for children but and youth and, and all of that, but for adults as well. And one of them is called the Shalom class, and that meets in the choir room, which is in the back corner here. And what's really cool about the summer is they're taking time and they're discussing uh, the worship service that we had, the message. And so it's kind of a, a nice way to really reflect on what you heard or what you're about to hear. So we encourage you to join that. We also have what's called So What? And this is a class that has a contemporary video that kind of deals with the things that you're dealing with maybe in your everyday lives. And it's a group discussion and how God can work in your lives in those moments. So I encourage you to come out at 930. And uh, at least for next week, you know, for the next one more week, we have lemonade to have, you know. So what's better than that? That and coffee. Um, all right. The next thing is VBS starts today. Camp is over. Can't believe it. It went by so fast. It was really great. Three weeks. And then t the VBS starts tomorrow. So uh, first of all, we have room for kids. If you know of any kids or if you want your uh, kids to come, there's plenty of room. Sign them up. Let me know. Whatever. We will make sure that they are uh, going to have a good time. I'm super excited for that. It's tonight or tomorrow from 6 30 to 8 30 and I would get here at about 6 15 to make sure you get into your cruise and ready to go if you want to help the best way right now is to donate and sponsor a child it's about $40 a kid and if you go to that uh, QR code it'll take you to the place where you can make a donation or even just register if you want to come out and see all the fun you're also welcome to so I encourage you to do that and this is also very very important there's one thing you remember I say today, that is next week after worship, we have a special town hall meeting. We will have lunch served, and we will have a water day for the kids out. If you have kids, we will keep them busy, but we encourage you to come, enjoy a bite to eat, and hear all of the really super, super duper exciting things that are coming down the pike in our future. So mark your calendars next Sunday, June the 30th, uh, about 12 p.m. And with that, Let's check out the children's story. So I am going to show you guys some signs and then I'm going to ask you if you can tell me what it is telling us to do. Wait, please. What do you think it's telling us to do? To be quiet. Who would use this kind of a sign? A librarian. Oh. No shirt, no shoes, no what? No service. What do you think that sign is trying to tell us? Like if you don't have clothes or shoes that they won't serve you. Who would use that kind of a sign? I have no idea. No. A water park? Restaurant? Here's the next one. Do not enter. What do you think that sign is trying to tell us? Just do not like enter a gate or like or a house or whatever it's called. Who would use a sign like that? In a science lab? Construction sites. A place of it full of venomous snakes and lions, tigers, and those. All right, here's another one. No swimming. Do not swim in the shark a beach. If like a place has a lake or something, it would say do not swim because it has like alligators. Right. 
You know what? Signs and rules are important because they help us know what to do. And some of them even help us to know how to live our best lives. Should we always follow a sign? What do you think? Why not? Some signs bad people put up. Because, like, it could lead you somewhere that you don't want to be. Alex, you said yes, we should always follow a sign. Why should we always follow this? Because some signs have to be correct, and some signs have to be wrong. Like, um, I accidentally did this, but I want to do this one. We what? should always follow signs because as they, uh, they tell us for our safety. So... The Bible may not give us physical signs, like the ones we were just looking at, but it does tell us what to do. Um, if you guys could sum it up, what do you think? That could... like, we shouldn't always follow signs, but if we do, that they can lead us to the right places, and that God is always with us. That the Bible kind of gives you signs along your life. We have to always believe in God and what He says. Bye. Bye, everybody. Amen. Can we give it for the kids one more time here? All right, so let's uh, go ahead and enter now into a time of offering. And um, yeah, just open your hearts for worship all year, uh, all year giving.
I got you. All right, no worries. I got you guys, I got you guys. Hold up, hold up. My job here is finished. Hello, I'm Mr. Lemonade, and we're selling 25 cents a cup for lemonade. Or more if you want it. After both services. All proceeds go to our VBS Vacation Bible School. <laughs> yes! Good morning! How's everybody doing? Good, good. It's great to see all of you, and I can really see all of you because the lights are on. This is awesome. It's great to see everybody. Uh, welcome to Peace Church. My name is Jim Burlow, the pastor, and if you didn't see the lemonade stand out front, make sure on your way out this morning you grab some lemonade and some treats because there's a lot of great stuff out there, and I went out there this morning to check on things, and they're like, sales are kind of rough this morning, Pastor Jim, and I was like, all right, well, we'll hype it up a little bit. So make sure you, you go by the lemonade stand on the way out this morning and pick up some stuff, and while we're at it, life throws us lemons, right? So this is what we're doing right now. We're throwing out some lemons for you. So who wants a lemon? Who wants a lemon? Uh, oh, I just threw it to like the emptiest part of the room. Lynn, I thought you'd die for it or something like that. We're going to go deep. They're right there. I'm going to take one to some special people that I just saw are here. Everybody welcome Melissa Fritchie. It's so good to see you. <laughs> here you go. Here, here's a lemon, John. I'll, I'm going to go sideways that way. There, there's a lemon over there. Uh, lemon throws us, life throws us lemons, right? I feel like I'm working with youth right now. This is crazy. Well, we'll put this right here and make it extra sacred. There we are. <laughs> so we're talking about uh, lemonade, right? And so um, what's one of the most important aspects of making lemonade? Is it the lemon? Right? I mean, don't you feel like that's pretty important? And what do you have to do to the lemon to, to make lemonade? You have to squeeze it, right? We have to squeeze the lemons to get the juice to come out. And then, of course, you know, if you don't squeeze the lemon and the juice comes out, you end up with just sugar water. And who wants to drink that? You know, maybe Tyler. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but the squeezing of the lemon is important. So let that image sink in for a second. The crushing and the pressing of the lemon. When we do that, something comes out that makes something that tastes really good. But it's not just with lemons. So uh, I remember when I was a bartender, I used to love making mint juleps. And uh, it had nothing to do with the drink itself. Really, it was all about the garnish. And so I'd make a, a mint julep, right? And then after making the drink, I would take a sprig of mint and I'd put it in the palm of my hand and I'd slap it. We called it shocking the, the sprig of, of mint. And when you shocked the mint, immediately this aroma would fill around the glass and in the air, and it smelled so good, friends. It smelled so good. And so think about that image this morning. The shocking, the crushing, the pressing can actually produce something good in our lives. So today we're continuing the series called Lemonade, and we all want to taste and enjoy the sweetness of life. Am I right? Can I get an amen on that one? Is it all right to ask for that? Um, and that's, that's, that's easy when everything is smooth sailing for us, right? But what about when it's not smooth sailing? Can hardships and trials produce the same kind of thing within us? Because we want to avoid those difficulties, but what if they produce something that's sweet within us? So isn't it Paul who wrote, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We might feel struck down, but we are not, what? Destroyed. And I don't think Paul was just talking about mint leaves and lemons here. I think he's making a theological point to all of us. Today, friends, let's consider God's faithfulness to us as we take stock of our faithfulness to God. Because the reality is sometimes we find ourselves in lion's dens, right? Sometimes we hear the heavy breathing of the darkness, uh, the darkness that we're in. And as we remain true and steadfast in our faith, the mouths of the lions will actually shut. But what we're talking about this morning is maybe that's not even the real miracle. What if the battles really fought long before we find ourselves in the lion's den? What if the sweetness of life can really be found in remaining consistent in our identity of hope? 
long before problems take root. So today, friends, let's remember God is faithful to us. And so let's remain faithful to God. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly and gracious God, in these moments, we uh, approach you maybe somewhat cautiously. Because in our seasons of life where things just seem to be going along smoothly, Lord, we admit that sometimes we for, forget <laughs> the immense full breadth of your power and your grace. And yet, in those times of trouble that some of us might find ourselves in right now, Lord, we might be drawing close to you, but help us to to persevere. Help us to, to make it through. Help us to really take a second and reflect on your goodness and your grace that just seems to overflow in those time periods. And so, God, help us to avoid complacency this morning. Open our eyes through the proclamation of your word and help us to see the importance of continuing to draw near to you in any season of life that we find ourselves in so that when we receive lemons in life, it will produce lemonade. For it's in your holy and blessed name that we pray. Amen. All right, so as you might have guessed this morning, uh, we're looking at that infamous story in the Bible. It's one of the classics, right? It's uh, one that children love. Sunday school teachers can't wait to, to talk about it and cover it. It's encouraged people all over the world for thousands of years. Yes, we're talking, of course, about the story of Daniel in the lion's den. But before we jump into this story, can we talk real quick and remind ourselves why Daniel ends up there in the first place? So King Darius of the Persian Empire, he appoints three leaders over those who governed all these different territories in Babylon. And Daniel is one of those leaders. See, the king sees Daniel as this person who is an honorable person. He's got high integrity, high levels of of confidence. And the only problem, though, is Daniel is not Persian. He's an Israelite. And so this upsets all of the other leaders. And so they consider him an outsider. And they are envious of why the king is so drawn to Daniel. And so they do this whole thing. They conspire against him, coming up with this trap that's all tied to Daniel's faith practices. So they talk King Darius into establishing this law that forbid anybody from praying to any god for 30 days. And if someone was caught doing this, well, let's just say they'd become dinner for the lions. And so the king agrees to this. He enacts this law, and he misses what it will mean for Daniel. In fact, here's what we read. We read that even in spite of this, Daniel knows that this law has been put into place. He still goes to his room. He, he opens the windows of his, of his room, and they open toward Jerusalem, right? And he gets on his knees, and he prays three times a day. Now, obviously, the people that are conspiring against Daniel, they see him doing this, and so they bring him before the king. And now the king is forced to respond to this quote-unquote infraction. And so the king has to throw Daniel in the lion's den. But the king's not happy about this, friends. We're told he doesn't sleep, he doesn't eat, he can't handle the fact that this is what's played out. And so let's hear how this whole thing resolves itself. And so we're going to read out of Daniel chapter 6. We're going to read verses 19 to 23. And then I'm gonna th- we're going to skip 24 But I'm going to throw in verse 25 for good measure. Does that sound all right with you guys? And then we'll read from 25 through to 27. So hear this story. So then at dawn, the king got up and at first light hurried to the den of lions. When he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? 
Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me because I was found blameless before him. Also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples and nations of every language throughout the whole world, May you have abundant prosperity. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people shall tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He delivers and rescues. His works He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's going to seem kind of like a strange transition out of this, but um, I love getting the oil changed in my car. And you want to know why? (laughs) Well, here's why. Because I'll take my car to the dealership to get the oil changed, and then I'll bring my laptop and my work stuff with me, and I'll walk down Orange Blossom Trail right to the Panera there, right? And then I basically go into Panera, and I got my refillable coffee, and I set up shop, and I get to work on my sermon. I know it sounds weird, but I just love being in that environment doing something like that. But here's where I get challenged. For some reason, when I'm doing this, I find myself listening to all of the people around me. I can't help it. I don't know. You might want to call it eavesdropping. I just call it sermon prep just to make myself feel better. But, but no, seriously, have you ever paid attention to how many voices are around us in public? It can be really distracting. And don't even get me started on the uh, voices in our heads. Right? Now, I'm not talking about those intrusive thoughts, which really six million people in our country suffer from that. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about those thoughts that are, uh, come from these unconscious beliefs that we have about ourselves. Some can be harmful. Others are frightening. Others might be just random. But these thoughts are normal. They're part of being human. And they can be distracting too. Tell me if I'm wrong here. Do they not take work to overcome. These are voices that convince us and tell us we aren't worthy or we're not smart enough. They judge our appearance or they cause us to question uh, what others think of us. They ask us, do you even know who you are? Distracting voices are everywhere. Now, friends, we read this story about Daniel, right? And if we look carefully, we really look at this thing, really, this story is told through the eyes of King Darius. And so in a way, this is almost King Darius' story as much as it is Daniel's. (laughs) And so given that, when we look at this story through that lens, we find, yes, this is how bad voices can get, (laughs) So, Daniel survives the night in the lion's den, right? I mean, that, there's, no, there's, a, there's no spoiler there, right? And we're told he, he comes out completely unharmed. But aren't you curious how that even happens? I mean, he tells the king, my God sent an angel who shut the mouths of the lions. I don't know, friends, isn't that what we're praying for, too? for the angel to quiet all of those voices that are going on in our heads and in our hearts and in our souls. But how does this happen? Well, Daniel gives us two insights. He tells us he was found blameless and found faithful. Can can we say that together? Found blameless and found faithful. So that's what happened for Daniel. But what about King Darius? How did he respond to all of those voices that were playing out in his spirit? Can we compare the two this morning? King Darius and Daniel? So to begin with, what does it mean to be blameless? Well, is it what my brother used to always say about me when we were growing up? He was like, Mom and Dad always liked you better because you never got in any trouble. And I was like, yeah, I know. (laughs) 
No, that's not being blameless, right? That's just being an annoying sibling. <laughs> um, but instead, let's think of being blameless, let's think of like credibility. Credibility, it comes from the Latin word credo. It means I believe. If something's credible, it's believable. It has integrity. It means, when we think of ourselves, it means as being honest or admitting your faults or being consistent. It means being trustworthy even with the smallest things in your life. You don't blame others. You are confident in admitting your limitations. So I don't know, friends, does that describe you? Because it sure described Daniel. That's what the king saw in him. And that's important, friends, because when we're blameless, others notice. It might take years to earn that kind of credibility in someone's heart. But based on what you do, people will begin to see who you really are. And so to have that kind of integrity, it means you have to have a strong sense of identity. And that's really what the king appreciated most about Daniel. Friends, the king was pagan. He wasn't even a believer in Daniel's God, yet he trusted Daniel more than anybody else. And so think about this. I think this is so fascinating how Daniel's blameless nature, his faith-filled identity, how far it reached even to touching a pagan king. It's amazing. But given that, what made the king sign this crazy law so quickly? Well, I wonder if he was wrestling with the voices in his own spirit, too. And if those voices were causing him to question his leadership or to be fearful of losing the support of his people, or maybe he was uncertain about what lied ahead for his future. And friends, those voices still exist today. Can I get an amen on that? And if those voices in our spirit go unchecked, it can cause us to do all sorts of things that we would never anticipate. It can lead us into these decisions we make, and as a result, we have regrets. That's what we see with the king. Especially when they bring Daniel before him as a result of this law. But like we said, Daniel knew exactly who he was. So Daniel was completely aware of this law, right? And yet, he continued to fling open the window of his room, kneel down and pray again and again and again. This was not an act of disobedience, friends. I don't know, uh, I always pictured Daniel in this story as being this young person. He was actually 80 years old when this story happens. And so what that tells us is this was a daily discipline of his. He was continuing this usual practice despite the lemons that life was giving him. He would continue to do this. And that's where the real battle takes place, friends. Because this is the moment where the voices are silenced for Daniel. In the practicing of these disciplines, this is where the mouths of the lions are shut. They're shut long before he ends up in the lion's den. It's through the practice of those daily disciplines that he's shaped and he finds confidence in his faith. That's where he becomes blameless. So I don't know, but what about those voices within us? The ones that we deal with on a daily basis. What practices are we remaining committed to? What is anchoring us in our faith? What shapes our character and strengthens our spirit? And are we doing those things long before the trouble actually shows up in our lives? Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Jesus say, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. And why did it not fall? Because it was founded on what? On rock, not sand. It's interesting, we're told that the king was deeply distressed by how all this whole thing had played out. We're told that he, he spent the night fasting, that no entertainment was brought to him, that, that sleep fled from him. Anybody else ever been in that kind of a position in the middle of the night? Why does it always happen between like 3 and 3.30 in the morning? Have you noticed that? <sighs> Through the dark of the night, 
it was almost like his foundation was just crumbling away because it was built on sand. And while the scripture doesn't say this outright, I believe Daniel, there in the dark of the lion's den at that same time, I think he was sleeping like a baby. (laughs) And why is that? Because he built his house on rock. He knew who he was. He had credibility. He was blameless and got there through the daily reinforcement of what he believed in and what he had faith in every day for 80 years. Friends, we're also told that he survived the lion's den because of that faith, that he trusted God even when he was in the den. So I read this quote somewhere. I think this is really cool. It's better to be a child of faith in a lion's den than to be a king without God in a palace. Is that not great? It's funny because as Daniel is lowered into the lion's den, the king, King Darius, he actually yells out to Daniel, may your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. Did you catch that? May your God. So at this point, this is not King Darius's God. Am I right? <laughs> but by the end of the story, the king gives this new decree, and it's almost like a, it sounds like a benediction to a worship service. He's like, may you have abundant prosperity, for the God of Daniel is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion have no end. Does that sound like a change in the king's heart? But how does somebody get there? Especially when we find ourselves in these places where life is throwing us lemons. Well, I think we go back to Daniel and those practices that he was committed to. Did you notice where Daniel's focus was when he was doing that praying? See, the reason that Daniel was caught praying was because his windows were wide open and everybody could see him. But he didn't do this to get everyone's attention. No, he opened those windows so he could look to the horizon, friends, because he would look toward the direction of Jerusalem. Everybody say Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is key here, friends. See, this was no ordinary city to Daniel. To him, Jerusalem was a symbol of hope. It signaled to him that, hey, in the midst of all that you're dealing with right now, there is a future, that there is a promise that you can hang on to. And so to remove Jerusalem from Daniel's sight, to prohibit him, from looking toward that city, almost robbed him of everything that he was. His entire identity was rooted in what Jerusalem symbolized to him. It was all about hope. And so it was the hope that pointed him in that direction, and as a result, he found hope. So I don't know, but what is our source of hope? I mean, what voices are challenging your view of Jerusalem, let's say? Will we find hope in Christ, friends, if we never look toward him? Will we have faith in the Lord if we never open our heart to him? Instead of focusing on complaining or being the victim or pointing fingers whenever we're in a a tough situation or whatever else, you know, those voices in our spirit tell us to do, what if we simply just positioned our heart toward Christ in the midst of that lion's den that we're in and then let Christ take over? What if in times of trouble, almost like the king, We reminded ourselves that the God that we worship is a living God. And there's a promise that God will deliver us. And this God endures forever. And this God's creation will not be destroyed. And this God, uh, this God's reign will never end. Friends, that's what the scripture promises us. Am I right about that? I mean, isn't that what Daniel's holy city reminded him of? Am I right about that? And isn't that what King Darius realizes As Daniel exits the lion's den completely unscathed. And so then why can't we let that kind of faith fuel our trust in difficult times too? And so friends, if you're facing a scary illness or if you're wondering when your career is, where your career is taking you or if your home life is harder than the life you find outside of your home or if you're unclear as to to what your purpose is or how you're going to just make it through the next day, if you're consumed by anger and anxiety and ask 
or in angst, I just want you to ask yourself, will I let this beat me, or do I serve a God who delivers? Will the voices always be heard, or can God silence them? Am I rooted in the darkness of the den or in the hope of Christ that I find within it? Because even if we're being crushed and pressed and shocked on all sides, friends, the Lord will still produce something sweet within this faithful life that we live for the Lord. You know, Daniel, uh, Daniel served as a model for one of the greatest figures of the 20th century, and that's Mahatma Gandhi. And I find this fascinating. In 1909, uh, Gandhi was released from this prison he was in in South Africa, and he was refusing to carry official papers while he was there. And so after he was released, Gandhi gave this speech in which he said that he found consolation in reading the book of Daniel while he was in jail. And he says that what he learned was that Daniel was one of the greatest passive resistors that has ever lived. And so he was calling for the Indian people in South Africa to follow that same example. And so he made sure to tell everybody that they have to fling their doors and their windows wide open in the face of injustice. And that key word there is open. Because Gandhi was interpreting that verb open out of the story of Daniel to be in the active voice, not passive. And what that means is it wasn't just like a one-time thing that Daniel did. No, what he was calling for was this ongoing act of unparalleled faith in the face of any kind of circumstance we find ourselves. And when we do that, when times are good, those mouths of those lions will close before we get in times of trouble. And so may we follow that lead. In the face of all of the lemons that life throws our way, may we hear this message that the Lord silences those distracting voices. When we find ourselves in danger, may we remain blameless as we trust in God. Always, may we remain rooted in our identity of hope in Christ. For God remains faithful to us, friends. And so the question is, will we remain faithful to God? This day and always. Amen. Can we all stand to our feet? And um, I know we've introduced this song not too long ago, but I just deem it appropriate for all of us to sing this together as one body. And um, so if you do know it, please pour out here.
a moment we're going to celebrate the sacrament of holy communion and as we prepare our hearts and consider the things that we want to bring before the Lord in prayer I want to ask you to include Reverend Bob Shaw in your prayers uh, Bob who's been a longtime member of the church he uh, he fell this weekend and really injured himself pretty bad and so him and Jean are dealing with that and she's taking care of him but we just uh, we just want to surround him in prayer as he heals from this and it's a little scary so we just want to make sure he's he's doing okay um, but, but we come forward in just a few minutes to, to celebrate the sacrament and be reminded of, of what this meal represents. This miracle that takes place in our spirit and in our heart long before we find ourselves crushed and pressed on every side. And so if we, like Daniel, can remain faithful in our practices of drawing close to the Lord, we can see how God remains faithful to us when we find ourselves in those troubles. I think that that's what this meal points to. It's what Jesus was preparing the disciples for when they gathered together and Christ took bread and gave thanks to God. For Christ broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when supper was over, he took the cup, and again, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. 
pray with me, please? Heavenly and gracious God, this is a morning about steadfastness and faithfulness. This is a morning about the promise that we find in your word that you are with us in challenging times and in good times. That you carve a way forward for us through any trial that we find ourselves in. And so God, in our spirit, as tired as it may be or as motivated and as inspired as it might be, Open our eyes to the ways in which we can remain steadfast and faithful to you in the same way. And so use this bread and this cup, Lord, to fill us with that spirit and unite us together as one, Lord, that as we engage in this sacrament together, as we step into this moment together, you would bind us together as one one church, one body, that we would reflect your heart together as the body of Christ in the world around us. For we pray all of this in your holy and blessed name. Amen. I'm going to invite our hospitality team to come forward, and once they're uh, in their places here, this table will be open to everyone. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any church to participate in this act all are welcome at this table. We're going to give you a piece of bread, or we have gluten-free here in the front as well, if you would like that. And then you'll be invited to take a cup of juice. And then we have the uh, prayer railings up here in the front where you can come forward and spend some time in prayer. And as you return back to your seats, you'll see these candle stations around the room. And you can light a candle there for someone that you're lifting up in prayer in your life. when you feel led to do so.
Amen, amen. All right, so uh, as we finish this service, I would love for you all to join me one last time in this last song. And if you can stand to your feet. great to be gathered together in worship this morning. Amen? Amen? Hey, everybody turn around and look right over here. Do you guys see? This is Miss Julie. Let me introduce you to you. Did everybody say hi, Miss Julie? Hi, Julie. 
Okay, so you know who she is, right? She's been throwing a lot of lemons at me for the past few weeks because I've been supposedly supposed to be asking everybody to help break down chairs at the end of the service. I've forgotten like three weeks in a row. We need it one more week. And so what are we waiting for, right? Today is the day the Lord has made. And if you are able enough, we would love for you to help us break down the chairs to kick off setting up for Vacation Bible School. All you got to do is come over and say hi to Miss Julie. She's a hard person to say no to, am I right? And so she's asking. Uh, but before you do that, go ahead and stretch out your hands to the neighbors around you, and we'll close with these words. And now may we go forward from this place in times that are good and before times get challenging, (laughs) being blameless and faithful, so that when we face challenges, we can see the ways in which God is being faithful to us in the midst of them. And so carry this message and live it out in the world, in the community, and even in our very own homes. And so go now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and have a blessed, blessed week. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.